Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you to C++ Russia for inviting me to speak here. I've never been to St. Petersburg. Um, I'm absolutely loving it, and they're taking very good care of me. So uh, thanks again. Um, before I start, I want to talk about include C++. Um, there is a big problem in the C++ community. Um, there are disproportionately few women and ethnic minorities represented here. I look out, I see lots and lots of people just like me. Um, and this is a big problem for hiring and solving the big engineering problems that we have. Um, there are just not enough of us. Um, now, you can help by joining in the effort of the Hash Include Discord. Um, and you can help us reach out to these groups, make them feel more welcome, tell them there's a place for them here. I noticed we have a code of conduct this time around. That's great. That encourages people to join in. It makes people feel safe. It makes them feel that we're not gatekeepers, but we're actually going out and recruiting from the community. Uh, and you can help by recruiting from outside of this community demographic. Thanks very much. Now, what to expect. So we have a brief history of geometry, linear algebra and geometry, lines and curves, polygons, regular and irregular, intersection and precision, and a summary of the classes and functions. Um, geometry, let's start with geometry. It's an ancient endeavor. Uh, it's the branch of mathematics concerned with questions of shape, size, relative position of figures, and the properties of space. It was also a favorite topic of mine at university, and time is short, so I'm going to draw attention to two people whom you will have heard of. The first is this man, who knows who this is? Euclid. It's actually written on the picture. Okay, that's fine, that's fine. Um, and this, Descartes, indeed. Who here has read Euclid's Elements. Yeah? Of course Eric has. I, that's taken as read. Anyone else besides Eric and Sean who has read Euclid's... No. Oh, yeah, really? All 13 books? No, not all 13 books. Okay. It is actually quite an easy read uh, for the sort of person who's going to attend this talk. Okay, if you're in this talk, the chances are you could read Euclid Elements. Um, it's, it's an easy read. There are a lot of pictures, so that's, that's good. Up until the beginning of the last century, it was actually presumed, well, certainly in England, it was presumed that anyone who was educated would have read Euclid's Elements. Um, not necessarily in the original ancient Greek, although you'd have got extra points for that. Um, you can get a PDF. There are band There's actually um, a Kickstarter uh, underway at the moment for a, a, a new bound edition for about, uh, I think it's about 16,000 rubles, which is a lot of money for a book, but it's a, it's a really beautiful book. Try it out. Um, so here's the first of 48 propositions, not quite, which arrives after 23 definitions, five postulates, five common notions, and in my copy, a diversion on the third person present perfect imperative, a uh, linguistic trait of Greek, um, it's contained in book one. There we are. Yes, clear as the river Neva. Here's the English version. Slightly clearer for me. Um, but it's how to construct an equilateral triangle given a finite straight line. You create two circles, which have the radius of this straight line. You put their centers at either end of the straight line. And where those circles intersect is the third point of the triangle. Since all points of the circumference are equidistant from the center of a circle. It's, it's magnificent. It, it, it's beautiful. It really is. Um, and this book, Elements, set the tone for mathematics. You know, mathematics has pretty much looked the same ever since. Definitions, postulates, and propositions. Now, geometry got us a long way in road and canal building, navigation, architecture, astronomy, all sorts of human endeavor. But it wasn't until the 17th century, which was nearly 2,000 years after this was published, the next great leap forward happened. Now, this was the work of Rene Descartes, one of the founders of modern philosophy. He's probably best known for mind-body dualism and a particular Monty Python song. Oh, good, yes. I, I'm getting older and older now, and I'm actually finding fewer and fewer people getting the references, so even two people laughing is still welcome. Um, but we're more interested in his contribution to mathematics. So according to his biographer, the story goes that um, during the night of November 10th, 11th, 
1619, whilst he was stationed in Neuburg an der Donau, Descartes had three dreams, and he believed that a divine spirit had revealed to him a new philosophy. Particularly, he formulated analytical geometry, just, just like that. It's, it's hard to overstate the impact that Descartes has had on mathematics, but this isn't a history of mathematics lecture. I'll, you know, research that yourself. It's always good to know the history. Now, analytical geometry works by introducing a coordinate system and giving every point in the plane a pair of real number coordinates. Real number coordinates. If this were a film, you would hear some cellos and some trombones playing some very serious music, as this foreshadows a significant problem with programming, uh, with geometry in programming in digital environments. And we'll return to this later. So the most common coordinate system is the Cartesian system. This takes the real number line. There would be an infinity there, but I'm having trouble with Unicode today. And it rotates a copy through 90 degrees, so each point is represented as an ordered pair of distances along each axis, horizontal then vertical. Less common is the polar system, where each point is represented as a distance from an origin and an angle of rotation, which is incredibly useful when working with rotations, but not so much when looking at straight lines and linear motion. You need to do transformations between the pair. It takes up a lot of computing power. Also, orientation is problematic. Do we measure clockwise or anticlockwise? Mathematicians go anticlockwise from y equals zero because the number line goes from left to right, whereas engineers go clockwise from x equals zero because the clock was invented in the northern hemisphere. If the clock had been invented in the southern hemisphere, but shadows travel in a different direction, then clockwise might have been in a different direction. We'll never know. We're stuck. It's unlikely to change in the next million years or so. Now, this can be extended into three dimensions by adding an additional axis, or indeed any number of dimensions, but I'm not going to cover that here. Um, the treatment of a torus, for example, as a four-dimensional object blew my head off whilst I was at university. We're going to stay away from that sort of thing. But now that we have algebra to work with, we can start doing work using equations and models rather than pictures. So let's start with a straight line. Rather than, uh, as Euclid did, simply drawing a straight line on the page and simply connecting it to other lines and to curves, we can define a frame of reference and describe a line as a set of points satisfying particular properties. So here we have a line. It's the set of points x, y, and r. That's r, the real number line, uh, the real number set. Um, such that y minus 2x minus 3 equals 0. Now, how do we algorithmically compute the full set of points? Well, thanks to algebra, we can rearrange this equation to y equals 2x plus 3. And all we need to do is go through every value of x and retrieve the corresponding value of y. And you'll recall from your elementary education that these two constants have names, the gradients and the y-intercept. And this gradient is what allowed Newton and Leibniz to come up with differential calculus. But of course, straight lines are not the only object of interest. Modeling curves is a big topic. So this is a simple parabolic trajectory. Um, this curve is a quadratic curve, typically made by throwing a ball in a vacuum, which I'm sure we've all done at least once in our lives. Um, it's the set of points x, y, and r, such that y plus x squared equals zero, or y equals negative x squared. One problem we have with this is that all our curves have a unique y value for each x, and so it can be expressed as a simple equation. But what about closed shapes, like a circle? So this is the set of points x, y, and r, such that x squared plus y squared minus three equals zero. Now, this doesn't rearrange to a simple equation. But what we can do is establish the points parametrically. So we can introduce a third value, t, and range it from naught to two pi, so that we can describe the circle as the set of points x, y, such that for t in r, and for t between naught and two pi, x equals three sine t, and y equals three cos t. Now finding models for shapes is quite a lot of fun, but what about arbitrary curves, things get rather more interesting now, as we have to worry about continuity, angles and asymptotes, and all manner of nonsense like this. And we'll return to this topic in a little more detail later on. Um, I, of course, need to remark on other fields of geometry. 
Um, my intention in this talk and, and with my upcoming paper to introduce geometry into the C++ standard is to particularly address the problems of modeling the physical world. Um, it would be enough to introduce a coordinate system for two and three dimensions, but analytical geometry is not the only game in town. Anyone here from CERN or, or done a shift at CERN? Sometimes I get a hand. Not today. Okay, um, you'll know all about differential geometry. It uses techniques from calculus as well as linear algebra to study problems in geometry set in differentiable manifolds. And it's where topology and differential equations um, intersect. If you know about non-Euclidean geometry, it got its start in this field, um, characterized by things such as diverging parallel lines, other brain-melting stuff like that. Algebraic geometry um, is becoming the linear algebra of the 21st century, frankly. Um, it feeds into many of the emerging fields of mathematics. Um, Fermat's last theorem was solved by Wiles using algebraic geometry. Geometric algebra is also a thing. It's the preferred mathematical framework for physics, and I could go on. But the point is that we need to qualify geometry with Cartesian or analytic to be absolutely sure of what we're talking about. Now, this has ramifications for any paper. What do we name our include header or module? What do we name our module? Modules, yes, yes. Um, it's tempting to type import geometry, um, but that might generate complaints. How about import Euclid or import analytical geometry? Um, Questions for, for, for later. Um, but more fundamental than analytic geometry is linear algebra. Now, last year, I started work on a linear algebra library uh, for the C++ standard with Bob Stiegel. And I've spoken at several conferences on this matter. I'll only present a brief summary um, of how this library is going to work, um, just so that we've got um, some context for the rest of this presentation. So let's look again at the general form of a linear equation. We have a sum of AX. B. So we can migrate this to the 2D plane with a little substitution. Where we just have two terms. Now we can substitute x1 and x2 for x and y, a1 and a2 for a and b. And this becomes by equals negative ax plus c. Since b and negative a are arbitrary constants, we can see that y equals mx plus c, which is the very familiar equation for a straight line. So we can see that any straight line can be represented with a linear equation. Generalizing to three dimensions, this would work for planes in much the same way. So representing a coordinate pair as a vector, vector, yes, you know what's coming. Thus, <laughs> we can translate, scale, shear, reflect, and rotate this vector. So translation takes place by adding the translation to the coordinate pair. Scaling works like this, either by a scalar multiplication, or we can achieve the same effect with a matrix multiplication. Shearing actually means scaling x and y by different amounts, which we achieve like that. Reflecting. That means multiplying a particular ordinate by a neg negative one. Rotating is a bit more complex, requiring this matrix multiplication. The linear algebra proposal offers a vector and a matrix class template. The API is dull and uninteresting. And that's exactly what you would expect it to be. It should not require teaching if you know what a vector and a matrix is. And this is the point of an API, the template parameters the proposal are far more interesting. Um, we can specialize for fixed size vectors and matrices of two, three, or four floats, which is what I would expect to use in my field, which is games. I'm the principal coding manager at Creative Assembly. I work on the Total War series. I have been doing so for about 20 years now. And games is what I live and breathe. And C++. And the standard. Of course, I'm not the first person to decide that what C++ needs is a geometry library, we must consider the prior art. So let's look briefly at Boost geometry. So this venerable library has been part of Boost for about 10 years now. It was authored by Balint Gerls, who works at TomTom. Uh, and from the introduction, Boost.geometry, also known as Generic Geometry Library, GGL, part of the collection of the Boost C++ libraries, defines concepts, those are old concepts, not new concepts, primitives and algorithms for solving geometry problems. 
It contains a dimension agnostic, coordinate system agnostic, and scalable kernel based on concepts, metafunctions, and tag dispatching. On top of that kernel, algorithms are built. Area, length, perimeter, centroid, convex hull, intersection for clipping, within for a point in a polygon, distance, envelope for a bounding box, simplified, transform, and much more. The library supports high-precision arithmetic numbers such as TT Math. Now, Boost Geometry contains instantiable geometry classes, but library users can also use their own using registration macros or trait classes. Their geometries can be adapted to fulfill Boost Geometry concepts. You can just plug your own stuff into the geometry library. Works a treat. It might be used in all domains where geometry plays a role. Mapping and geographic information systems, particularly TomTom -tom make you know, in-car navigation systems. Um, game development, obviously, computer graphics, robotics, astronomy, all sorts of things. The core is designed to be as generic as possible and support all of those domains. Um, but this gives us a great starting point. So let's look at what's on offer. First of all, dimension agnostic. So it uses the same interface to support 2D and 3D operations. Um, note that the linear algebra proposal is also dimension agnostic. Um, it's also coordinate type agnostic, so it can use integers, floats, anything you choose, just like the linear algebra proposal. So this is feeling pretty good so far. It feels like a good fit. So we have dimension and type agnosticism. So let's consider a distance function. We want the shortest distance between any two things. For example, two points, or a point and a line, or a line and a polygon, or a point and a polyhedron. Um, and these will all have different algorithms. Calculating the distance between two points simply requires Pythagoras uh, in the appropriate number of dimensions. Um, the point line case requires uh, extending the line, projecting a normal to the point, and seeing where the intersection is, choosing the closest endpoint if there is no intersection. But this is not really any different from the linear algebra case of addition, where different shapes of matrices demand different addition algorithms. And again, we have a parallel with linear algebra that we should be able to exploit. Um, Boost Geometry also offers functionality independent of coordinate systems. Um, indeed, everything is looking pretty rosy here for a good fit between the linear algebra proposal and this existing geometry library. But there's one thing that Boost Geometry doesn't offer, and that's a way of describing curves. So let's consider how we can model geometric objects in C++. The mathematician will tell you that a line is a set of points satisfying a particular qualification. For example, the x-axis is a set of points x, in R, x, y, and r, such that y equals zero. But it's not a line of finite length. There are no endpoints. More useful would be a line segment with two endpoints. For example, look at this line segment here. It starts at three, negative 3, 1 and ends at 5, 5. Or does it? Hmm. It's meant to end at 5, 5. I think I might have my projection a little wrong. Right, so this is the set of points x, y in R, such that negative 3 is less than or equal to x is less than or equal to 5, and y equals half x plus 5 over 2. So how might this be modeled in code? Well, two ways spring to mind. A struct with the gradient and the y-intercept for a non-finite length segment, or a struct with the two endpoints. I'm being a little coy here. I've been describing everything in terms of the set of points in R. But of course, that's not actually a domain available to us on a digital computer. We don't have access to every possible number. At best, Q. We can only hope for the set of points in Q. And even then, we can't span that with built-in types. There is not, as yet, a rational type in the standard. Um, and I don't think any processors expose that sort of thing natively. I don't think there are pro processors which have you know, native rational numbers. Uh, if anyone knows any different, I'm, I'd be fascinated to hear. Um, we can't represent this number, 3,244.7482, using the float type. Can anyone guess why? Precision, exactly that. Floats are only precise to about five orders of magnitude, five base 10 orders of magnitude. And this will become a significant problem later on. 
cellos, trombones again. Okay. And we'll return to that. Now, I need to take a little diversion now and talk about the Bernstein polynomial. Anyone seen this before? Good. Okay, some people nodding. Okay, good, good, good. Um, so we start with the Bernstein basis polynomials. They look like this. Um, the NV term is a binomial coefficient. So here's a simple example where you're just simply substituting, well, it's substitution. Um, so a linear combination of these forms a Bernstein polynomial, which looks like this. So the coefficients, BV, are known as Bernstein coefficients or Bezier coefficients. Who's heard of the word Bezier with regards to, yeah, right, okay, good. More foreshadowing. Bernstein polynomials are particularly useful for approximating continuous functions. Okay? So this is very convenient in the computing field where we are dealing with approximation for discontinuous domains. Okay? We don't have access to all the real numbers. It's a discontinuous domain. Let's move back to lines and curves. We start with a straight line, which we observed satisfies the equation y equals mx plus c. How do we represent this set of points? What are we trying to actually capture? So I think we can agree that a vector of non-integer pairs would be a very bad idea. For example, there are four billion floating point numbers, but apart from that, there's no guarantee that for each x value, the corresponding y value is available in the same domain, as shown earlier. We could try this, a gradient, intercept with the y-axis, as we showed earlier, so that, you know, that should be enough for, for representing a line. A class called line with two floats or doubles, or whatever you're using for your number line, one called M gradient and one called uh, intercept. But we very rarely deal with such abstract things. Usually we are dealing with line segments, so we need to constrain the class still further by adding the bounds to the line. So we can update the class to include P1 and P2. We might want to imply direction with P begin and P end. So our constructor would include two points and work out the gradient and intercept from those points. Uh, but you might wonder if the gradient and intercept are necessary. You know, they're easy to calculate. Is caching each gradient and intercept worth it? And that depends on how you expect to use them. In my domain, we only care about the endpoints. All the rest is lazily evaluated. Straight lines, that was easy. How about curves? So we have a problem here. There's one equation for a straight line. And there are many, many different equations for different types of curves. Um, in, again, in my domain, we ask artists to create things by drawing with a stylus on a tablet. We can't ask them to model things using equations. I don't know how many artists you might know, but presenting them with a request to create a model for a dinosaur using only x's and y's and things like that will, will, will not be met with a happy smile. Um, I do recall, actually, long ago, and I'm talking about 25 years, 30 years ago, perhaps, um, I used 3D packages that would have a palette of primitives um, to choose from, regular polygons and polyhedra, and you'd simply apply deformations to them until you got the shape that you wanted. And while it was effective, it kind of did the job. If, if you didn't want anything too realistic in, in appearance, it was okay, but it was completely useless. Um, when it came to the normal development of your typical artist, they work freehand. So are we back to capturing a vector of pairs of points? God help us, no. Um, there is a, way, a better way. Um, we can capture curves piecemeal and we can string them together. So again, let's look at a parabolic curve, y equals x squared. Now, you can actually see all sorts of curves in this parabola. Um, down here, you've got a quarter of a circle. Up here, you've got a much shallower curve. Um, and that should be enough for us to get on with. We can say we just want this part of a parabola here and this part of the parabola here. Um, but how do we store that? Because we don't want to store a set of points. And we can't simply store coefficients of an equation. It's y equals x squared. We need to store a start point and an end point and some way of saying which part of the parabola we're tracing. Um, and the best way to do that is to include another pair of points describing the x range of the parabola. And you can imagine how this would work in a drawing program. Um, you'd invite the artist to put down two points, 
and then superimpose a parabola and invite them to move and scale the parabola until they got the right curve, the right, the right point, point that they wanted. It's not enormously intuitive as user interfaces go. I wrote one like this many years ago. It was horrible, but you know, it was a start. So that's four points in total. P1 and P2 for the start and end point that you're plotting, and C1 and C2 for the points on the parabola that you want to put between them. Um, we can actually do it with three points, because it seems like you know, moving the parabola around that pair of points with a mouse suggests that maybe we need the one point, um, and of course we can. It's called a quadratic Bezier curve, and that individual point is called the control point. Uh, so they're named after a chap called Pierre Bezier, who used them to design cars at Renault in the early 1960s. Who remembers what, okay, no, nobody remembers what cars in the 60s look like. Who has seen pictures of car, French cars in the 1960s? They were all curvy, swoopy curves uh, and, and reaching for the future. They were very, they were very pretty. Um, and that's why, because suddenly they had a way of modeling curves. Bang. You know, um, so they thought, right, we'll use these. Shiny hammer, lovely, lovely curves everywhere on all my cars. Um, Citroën, however, uh, can lay claim to the study of the mathematical basis for these curves by a chap called Paul de Castellau. Um, but yeah, curvy French cars in the 60s. It's, it's all maths. Let's look at the maths. The general form of a Bezier curve is this. So N is the number of control points, uh, P. And B, I of N, is the Bernstein basis polynomial. So that makes BT a Bernstein polynomial. We can expand this for two control points. So B of T equals P naught plus T, P1 minus P0, uh, and which is the same as 1 minus T times P naught plus T times P1. That's the parametric equation for a straight line. As T increases, you get a little more of P1 and a little less of P0. So we're back to our first class. Right, what about for three control points? So naively, it looks like this. Bt equals 1 minus t of 1 minus t p0 plus t p1 plus t of 1 minus t p1 plus t p2. Now that can be interpreted as the linear interpolant of the corresponding points on the linear Bezier curves from p0 to p1 and from p1 to p2, respectively. We can rearrange the equation. There we are. And this can be written in a way which highlights the symmetry with respect to P1, like this. So here, we've simply got a, we're traveling from P0 to P2 via P1. Now, what's good about this is we can look at this derivative and we can conclude that the tangents, the curve at P0 and P2 intersect at P1. So as t increases from 0 to 1, the curve departs from P0 in the direction of P1 and then bends to arrive at P2 from the direction of P1. Okay? Do you know what? We all need a picture. There we are. P0, P1, P2. See it again? Lovely. So, armed with this equation and three control points, we can make a curve. So here's a curve class. Okay, that covers our pen primitives. What about shapes? Now, life gets considerably easier now. We've defined our primitives, and everything else is just made up of these primitives. Kind of. So that's the simplest polygon possible. A triangle. You knew that was a triangle, sorry. Um, how would you, well, there's a way of defining it. We have three corners, three edges, enclosing a space. We just need to define a class with three points. A square, four points, easy. But this isn't going to scale, is it? You know, um, what about an arbitrary polygon or just some enclosed space? How about a vector of points? and a vector of edges joining the points together. 
Uh, tech over there. I seem to have no power, and my laptop is running low. I'll carry on anyway. Um, what are we talking about? Oh, yes. Vector of points. No, we don't want that. Um, what we need to come up with a way, uh, come up with is a way of identifying points. So we could try a vector of points and then a vector of pairs of integers, identifying which points are connected in which order, or perhaps a vector of edges. Well, the cheapest thing to do is a vector of points. And then in further shape, by iterating through them. And if you want to cache the edges, you can do that. Uh, and that gives us our polygon class, really. You can still have your triangle and your square and your pentagon classes. Um, they're a special kind of polygon, a regular polygon. So do we want to encode that fact? How about a base class called shape? Don't do that. This isn't the 90s. One advantage of regularity, though, is that you can use that to infer other information. For example, a regular polygon can be completely defined by a center, and a vertex, and the number of vertices, and the orientation of the first point, maybe from the x-axis or from the y-axis. Um, and maybe you do want a regular polygon class and an irregular polygon class. So I'm going to take a small diversion here and talk about 2D coordinate systems. Now, the rule is that a coordinate system must uniquely define a point in the vector space, which is spanned by the bases. So the Cartesian coordinate system is established by taking the number line and rotating it one quarter turn. But it doesn't need to be one quarter turn. Um, it makes the vectors orthogonal, which is helpful. Um, but you could have a coordinate system that looks like this. Um, and I've already described polar coordinates, where the Cartesian coordinate system works by traveling from the origin along the x-axis uh, and then parallel to the y-axis. And polar coordinates travel along the x-axis and then turn about that origin by the second value. Um, if you recall your complex analysis, you'll know that complex numbers uh, can be described in a similar way to polar coordinates, which leads to interesting results about e to the power i theta. Um, and these are called log polar coordinates. Now, the trouble with these non-Cartesian coordinate systems is they'll, they'll never be as fast for me when it comes to rendering something. Uh, in my domain, I need to render rectangles, um, and that means transforming and projecting everything along straight lines. But we still have to deal with curved shapes. I've got about two minutes of power left. I do have an adapter. It's plugged in right now. Okay. So, let's start with a circle. We can't describe this as a series of edges. We have to return to first principles and model it as a center and a radius. So we have a circle class. What about an ellipse? There's two foci, and the major or minor radius are enough to cover this. We have five floats and a flag for that. The flag is to tell us whether or not it's ablate or prolate. But again, regular polygons are not enough. Anyone heard of a stadium? Stadium shape? No, a few nods, OK. Looks like this. I'll have a direct use case for you. Has anyone played Asteroids? You know the game Asteroids? Yeah? All right, strap in. This isn't a video, this is me playing. Ah! Unbelievable! <laughs> that was the highlight of my talk. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Do you know how long I spent writing all that? <laughs> I'm, I'm sure you are. <laughs> it's not fitting, is it? How about in there? Do you know what? Let's. Oh, that's it. It lights up, you see. It lights up, but when you. Oh, it doesn't That's light up. Okay, well, how about in here? Okay. Let's 
Splendid. Okay, then, boy. Uh, these things happen. Uh, this would have happened anywhere where I have an adapt. England has a three-point power supply. It's great. It's super safe. You have a socket. Or you, you have a plug. You plug it in the socket. There's a switch on there. No one else uses it. <laughs> Singapore. All right. Okay. Uh, oh God. Right. <laughs> right. Okay. So here's asteroids. Oh my God. Get out of the way. There we are. Right, we have a problem here. Because what happens? I'm actually trying to crash. Oh, there we are. So we need stadiums. When the ship gets, gets destroyed, it has to respawn in the middle of the screen. But it has to do so when it's not in danger of being destroyed by any asteroids. That would be terribly unfair. Um, the simplest solution is to inspect every asteroid, see what area it's going to sweep out by its movement over the next two seconds, or fewer, if you're feeling mischievous, and see if any of those areas intersect with the center of the screen where the craft will spawn. And the area that asteroid will sweep out is a stadium. So, it consists of a rectangle and two semicircles. Um, we can store that as two foci and a radius, five floats again. Um, that's still kind of cheating, though. These first three examples were merely models of well-defined shapes. You know, what about an arbitrary Kirby shape? So we saw in the example of the Bezier curve that we can use a single control point to create a segment of a parabola. What happens if we increase the number of control points? And that can certainly produce a huge variety of curves, um, but with an overlapping beginning and end point, um, that can give us a closed shape with a curved outline. But as the number of control points increases, then the calculations become considerably larger to undertake. Um, remember, the polynomial has per-point terms. So the more points, the more work is required for each iteration through the parameter. The proper solution is to simply have a succession of Bezier curves. One approach would be to have a set of pairs at the start point, the control point, and an optional endpoint for an open curve. You can make a circle or an ellipse from four Bezier curves. Uh, you can make a stadium from four Bezier curves and two straight lines, although that would need an additional flag for each segment to say whether or not it was a curve. Um, there's another way to implement a shape, and that's with a bicubic Bezier patch. This beast is modeled like that. So P is the patch evaluated over the unit square, where U and V range from naught to one. B is the Bernstein polynomial, um, and this deforms the unit square in the dimensionality of the control points, K, uh, which is an array of 16 points. So this makes M and N equal to 3. You're going from 0 to 3 of this array of 16 points. Um, I'm not going to write this out. It's a 16-term polynomial. So as you can imagine, computationally quite expensive. Um, but in three dimensions, whoa. Right, I just want to take a quick diversion now into the most knotty topic in computational analytic geometry, and that's intersection. Okay? Two lines intersect if they cross over. Two polygons intersect if they overlap. But we need to be a little more rigorous than that. Recall that a line is a set of points. So two lines intersect if there is a point that is common to both sets. So let's revisit two lines, y equals x minus 1 and y equals 2x minus 4. Do they intersect? All right, hands up who thinks they don't intersect. They do intersect. They have different gradients. They must intersect, OK? So subtract one from the other. You get that. So they intersect where x equals 3. That's easy. Let's try another. y equals x squared, y equals x plus 3.9. So do a bit of maths, solve a quadratic equation, and you'll see they intersect in two places 
0.5 plus or minus the square root of 4.15. Now, that square root is a problem. Um, that number can't be represented on a computer. It is not a rational number. Only rational numbers can be correctly represented on a computer. Um, it's worse than that, actually. Consider these two straight lines, y equals x over 3 and y equals x minus 2.3. They intersect at x equals 3.45. That number can't be represented in binary floating point arithmetic. Um, so you remember the thing I was talking about, magnitude of floats. Here's a picture of the distribution of floats in two dimensions. As you can see, the concentration of floats, so we've got the origin in the center. Um, the concentration of numbers increases towards the origin. We'd expect this, because remember that there are as many rational numbers between zero and one as there are greater than one. Um, so I make a game called Total War. It's tabletop warfare on a computer, battlefields. It's great. Everyone should go. Has anyone played Total War? <sighs> thank you. Thank you. Um, but we model field warfare on a large scale. Um, battlefields are about 10,000 meters square. Combat takes place at a much finer resolution. So I need a volunteer. Can I have a volunteer, please? You need to stand there. Oh, thank you. Oh, Marshall, you sweetie. Thank you. Right, round of applause for the brave volunteer. <laughs> uh, not a sword, no. Okay. <laughs> right, so I'm going to punch Marshall. No, it's all right. Marshall doesn't need to speak. No, it's probably better if he doesn't in this case. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to punch Marshall in the face. There we are. I missed. I missed your face by about two centimeters. Okay, thank you, Marshall. You can sit down. That is going in my diary. <laughs> right, how many centimeters are there in 10,000 meters? A million, thank you. So if we try and model that using five orders of magnitude, we could get that wrong. And I would probably actually hit you. So hooray for reality, okay? Um, we would need to use a type with greater precision, but that would mean doubling our memory budget. We'd have to go up to a to a, to a double rather than a float. Um, or we could lose our hardware advantage and move to a custom type in software. These are not really opportunities open to us. Um, we could move to integer maths and work entirely in millimeters. Um, so if you're in a 32-bit integer, you have 4 billion millimeters available to you. And that gets you from London to Ankara. So that's rather larger than our usual battlefields. But that would send our artists and our tooling folk completely mad because they work in SI units. Of course, fists and faces are quite big things. But in general, the number of occasions in which there is going to be a false result is pretty small. Um, but consider an animation where a sword swings against another sword. Swords are thin, OK? There's very little tolerance indeed for those. And if the paths intersect, we get a hit. But actually. Getting that intersection right, really quite tough. Swords move pretty fast. There's a danger that in the process of sampling, um, the sword passes through the other sword entirely. Uh, worse still, moving 2.3 meters to the side may make a difference. That's the resolution we're working at. So we are in a lot of trouble when it comes to intersection. How do we deal with a pers prospective function like intersects? Well, we can't. What we have to do is add an additional parameter to describe a tolerance. So who knows, besides Marshall, what the difference is between FLT min and FLT, of course Marshall knows, and FLT epsilon. Anyone want to embarrass themselves in front of the chair of the library working group? I didn't think so. OK, I hope I've got this right. <laughs> Flut min is the smallest number that could be represented with float while flut epsilon is the difference between 1.0 and the next float representable number. Yeah? Round of applause for me, thank you. <laughs> epsilon is, no, no, not really, shush, shush now. Right, epsilon is used in maths. Um, epsilon is used in maths to signify 
an arbitrarily small quantity. If we want to see if two points are the same, we will need to specify how samey they need to be. You know, so um, some noise has already been introduced by sampling uh, the plane, and we need to account for that in our functions. So a function would need to look something like this to allow an error tolerance due to sampling. One of the things I always look out for during code reviews for new starts is the presence of direct comparison of two floats. And if I was doing this presentation tomorrow, I would be stealing Sean's picture of the coat check lady because that's exactly the face I give when somebody decides to compare two floats. Because that probably isn't what they meant. Um, dissuading people from using the equality operator on floats is a tough and thankless job. Right, let's review our set of types. So first, we need a coordinate system, stood math, and means by which to perform transformations. I'm hoping to secure a sub namespace, math, so that we, re we can reuse the name vector. Uh, so we can start with stood math vector. Particularly, I want to see specializations so that I don't need to be messing around with lots of angle brackets. So for example, I'd like to see something like that. Uh, so FS vector action, vector engine and FX matrix engine are storage um, mechanisms in the linear algebra proposal. Go and look at the linear algebra proposal. It's, it's all fine. I'll talk about it in Moscow if you have me back. Um, better still, I would like to have this as being implementation defined so that implementers can use their knowledge of the target to implement the vector, for example, using SIMD registers and intrinsics to do the job instead. This is really important and strikes at the heart of one of the problems in my domain. Game dev people bypass the standard as far as possible. That's, that's what we do. We say, no, no, this is too slow. Get rid of all this. I'm going to roll my own vector class. Um, we know more about our domain than the library implementers in general, our particular programming domain than the library implementers. And we end up implementing a lot of the work ourselves. For example, no exception handling, no RTTI. Um, the current linear algebra proposal is very flexible and will accommodate many, many use cases. But one of the largest use cases for linear algebra in, pract compute, in practical computing is in geometry. My linear algebra engine is super tuned for geometry. Uh, the matrices and vectors are formed of SIMD registers. Um, the functionality is supplied via SIMD intrinsics because I know all about my target platform. It only has to compile for x64 machines with recent Intel processor instruction sets. That's quite an advantage. So I want a path next. And a path segment may have three or maybe four control points. If it has two control points, it's a straight line. If it has three control points, it's a quadratic Bezier curve. If it has four, it's a cubic Bezier curve. Um, these are used in motorway design. You know, when you're driving along the road, the, the, the road will swing pleasingly in front of you because it's, in fact, a Bezier curve. Um, I haven't gone into much detail about them. Um, we start getting into spline territory, and people start having arguments about whether or not we should use B splines. Or It's out of scope for this talk. There are lots of different ways of describing curves. Um, so a path is therefore a container of segments which may have a varying number of control points, which sounds like a use case for std variant. Um, perhaps we want three kinds of path, one composed of just line segments, one composed of Bezier curves, one composed of mixed lines and curves. Polyline, perhaps, polycurve. Then we want special closed paths or polygons. We might want a regular polygon class, looks like, a bit like this, which we can simply describe with a using statement. Then we have circle, ellipse classes, maybe a stadium class. Seems a bit specialist, but you know. And finally, we have a patch class consisting of 16 control points. Uh, I say finally because, as I remarked, 3D seems like a bit of a reach for the time being. Uh, I'm not going to try that. If anybody wants to have a go, go for it, do so. Wait for me, though, all right? Um, but I don't believe that any of this precludes doing geometry in, in arbitrary, dimension, uh, arbitrary dimension objects. And I've still only actually described vocabulary types. There's no, um, there's no functionality here yet, uh, which is important. I'm not a great big fan uh, of, of big APIs. We already have one example of that, which, can't, which we can't go back from, which is, of course, the basic string. That's quite a large API. There are probably better ways of doing this. Um, 
But I think all the functionality of geometry should be implemented as free functions. Um, but which ones? What do we want to actually do? Well, we've already described intersects. Uh, it should be able to offer an intersection. Oh, I didn't fill out the parameters. There are meant to be some parameters there. You can make them up later if you like. Um, it should be able to offer an intersection of any two objects, not just lines. Um, more fundamental than that is distance, which gives you the separation of two points, and length, which gives you the length of a path. Then we're into two dimensions. Contains will tell you if one shape is completely inside another. Area is analogous to length. Perimeter is equivalent to length. Centroid gives you the central point of a polygon or a patch. While envelope gives you the axis aligned rectangle that bounds a shape. Um, there isn't actually that much to do to offer ge geometry support in the standards. So this might be quite a snappy little proposal. Uh, but stay tuned and thanks for listening. Ask me two questions, please. Uh, you would like two questions. I just picked a number. Because <laughs> <laughs> I think we have time maybe for even more. Uh, questions? Uh, first, uh, thank you for the wonderful presentation. Thank you. Uh, second, I have a question. In the uh, Usually in plotting the programs which plot functions, do they use the, these ways which you explained, like getting two points or three and uh, putting uh, this B, A, B number, you explain like we can get some point of the curve and it's enough to draw the whole curve? That's enough. Or, um, or they just use the fact that uh, we have uh, not many pixels on the screen so it can brute force them? It depends, uh, which is a very weak answer. But there are different, different programs will have different uh, requirements of their curves. For example, plotting software will indeed ask you, will, will, will want to plot you know, a series of points for, for a, you know, a, a sales curve or something like that. Whereas you, you might want to be able to describe them by equation. It, you're kind of crossing over into 2D graphics here. about how do we want to render a line? Do we want to render it point at a time? Do we want to represent it as a, you know, as, 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 as a curve? Does that answer your question? Yeah, good, okay, thank you. Who's next? Uh, hello. Hello. I have two questions, okay. exactly. So, uh, you told about paths, but uh, I haven't heard anything about closed paths. About? Closed paths. So closed paths. Right. Bezier, uh, um, a geometrical object represented by closed Bezier curves. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you're going to have it in the proposal, then how are you going to solve the intersection problem? Intersection of two closed uh, areas represented by Bezier curves. Mm -hmm. As far as I know, uh, like some libraries like Qt don't implement, don't implement it properly. Uh, they break the Bezier curves into line segments mm -hmm. and then do intersection. Yep. So if it will be implemented, then this problem should be addressed somehow. Yes. And I probably missed it. Uh, is there any uh, freestanding function for finding distance to line or to curve? Yes. So I'll answer your second question first. That's an easy answer. The answer is yes. Um, the first question, I, well, you got me. I don't know yet. Uh, this is pretty fresh. I'm still working out the details. And yes, the idea of two overlapped closed paths, or ass assessing whether or not two closed paths overlap, um, yeah, it is quite a hard one. Uh, look, the Goodyear blimp over there. Do you see? <laughs> but actually, uh, the problem of distance to Bezier curve uh, is also not very simple as far as I remember. No, that's not simple, no. Uh, so Again, another one I'm, I'm working on. Uh, Trump, Donald Trump, over there, <laughs> quick, catch him. <laughs> OK, thank you. <laughs> oh, there's always one, isn't there? Yes, there are holes in this proposal. It's, it's, it's a new proposal. There's still lots I'm trying to work out. I've, I have solved these problems in fairly cheaty, hacky ways in the past, but obviously I need to come up with something a bit more, a, a bit more suitable for all domains. Yep, another question. So yes. when you was talking about, uh, when you were talking about lines, you mm -hmm. said that the best representation, as I understood, is to store uh, two points on a line. 
Yeah. But that representation is quite inefficient if you want to do anything with line at all. If you want to check whether a point lies on a line, when you want to calculate distance from a line, you always have to convert that line back to uh, equation like yep. AX plus y, y. So why did you chose that representation? As I say, these are all, these are all starting points. Okay. That, that was a pun. <laughs> these are all starting points for this proposal. I want to start a, com a conversation about geometry. You know, that's really what I want to do. It's, this is kind of a straw man for everyone to tear down. You're doing an excellent job. Thank you. <laughs> More questions? Okay. Okay, so yeah, I have another question about Turing that rolls down. So you were talking about shapes, uh, but there is also, but there are also solids, it's like a shape with, which also contains all points inside it. Mm -hmm. And they also can be infinite, like you have a parabola, but you can uh, consider not a parabola, but parabola with uh, half of the plane inside. Yes. So that also can be quite useful to represent. So do mm -hmm. you have any considerations how we can represent that? Uh, no, do you know what? Tweet me. I'm open for messages. Can I use Telegram? Sorry? Can I, do you use Telegram instead? Sorry. Yeah, but... <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> As, sorry, as the detail gets fine to these questions, it may be better for, to, to just, I'll, I'll open a GitHub repository at some point, we can open issues, you can get pull requests, okay? I, I, I absolutely hold my hand up, I say this is by no means a complete proposal. There, 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 there's still plenty of stuff to think about, okay? Uh, first of all, Guy, thank you very much for a nice presentation. And uh, uh, maybe I missed it, but uh, what's the state of the proposal? Uh, what is the stage? Uh, have you presented it to standard committee? Or okay, I haven't, uh, well, I haven't written R0 yet. I'm still working on finishing linear algebra. Uh, this is going well. It's going to library evolution in uh, Belfast if there is time. We're at a rather particular technical stage of the standardization process. Once that's through, the next thing I want to look at is, uh, is geometry and also uh, input and output, uh, hardware input and output, keyboards, that kind of thing. So uh, not there yet, just you know, watch well, the skies. When do you think we can expect it to go to be standardized? <sighs> well, it's, it's the all number. take, 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 isn't it? <laughs> um, well, just. Yeah, yeah, I know, I, I, I jest. Um, yes. Next year, sometime next year, probably. Oh, when to, when to be standardized? Oh, I don't know that. that that's. <laughs> Marshall, how long does it take for a paper to be standardized? <laughs> Plus plus zero x. Any any time, you know. It, it would be nice to make twenty three, but uh, you know we're already you know rubber stamping twenty, and uh, there's only nine nine meetings between standards, which is you know it's a surprisingly little amount of time. We'll see. Okay. Good luck. Thank to you. you in this. Yep. I will need it. Uh, do you plan any integration with Eigen Library? open source library for linear alg algebra? I'm, I'm quite familiar with Eigen. Um, that, that's really a question about the linear algebra paper. I will answer that privately next. <laughs>